I never thought much of The Complete Angler by Isaac Walton. I think it's a pretty pompous and boring book. Of course, it's got some historical interest, but there isn't much evidence that Walton was a top angler. I wish some real expert from the same period had written it. The thing that makes me really suspicious of Isaac Walton is his story of cooking and eating a chub. A chub is absolutely uneatable. Somebody once said it's like wet cotton wool full of pins. It's a pity because I like the chub. He's big and strong and interesting, and he taxes an angler to fish for him well. Really, there are two separate sorts of chub angling, summer and winter. In the summer, all stealth and field craft. In the winter, all patience and cunning. In summer, he lies high in the water, and you must get your bait to him without him seeing you, without him knowing you're there. Big baits, all sorts. He'll go for the most varied diet. You can try him with bread, cheese, sausage, grasshoppers, slugs, little frogs. You either trot them down to him a long way off, so he's taking them at a distance and he can't know you're there, or you can dap them to him, creeping up unseen right close and working out your tackle infinitely slowly. In justice to Isaac Walton, I must say that his piece about dapping for Chubb is the best bit of the book. I tried it once, just as he described it. I was fishing for two days on the River Allen, and at the beginning I found a shoal of big chub under a cattle bridge. When I looked at them, they just drifted down. They do that. They don't dash away in a panic like other fish. They just fade away and ignore you in a very aristocratic way. So I put my lunch bag, my hat on it, at the edge of the bridge, and put the spare rod down alongside it, and I left them there all day for them to get used to. And the next day, I carefully worked myself into the same position, with my hat on, with my rod beside me. And then, with my hand well back on the bridge, I flicked pieces of crust in with my thumb. They didn't take any notice of them at first. Then they started to turn and look at them, and in the end, they were taking them just two foot below my nose. So at that point, I hooked a piece of crust on a long slack line from the rod and flicked it out the same way. The biggest chub came up to get it. Unfortunately, a slightly smaller one raced him for it, but it was very tense and exciting. In the winter, again, you need a large bait, but you have to give him a long time to look at it. He lies down in deep water and you have to cast down to him there and leave it there. He may keep you a very long time staring at it, thinking about it. But in the end, he's liable to take it because he will feed even when it's too cold for other fish. This business of temperature is important to fish. And the water thermometer is a tool with which you ought to start the whole day. And just as Dick Walker demonstrated just how much light will bring fish on the feed or put them off, you can do the same with temperature. Owen Wentworth and I did it once quite recently. We started on a cold day after a frosty night and the water was cold and we could catch nothing. We had the water thermometer in the water and we kept taking it out to see what the temperature was. At water, 40 degrees, we caught nothing. At 42 degrees, we caught two or three chub. At 43 degrees, the dace came on and exactly at 45 degrees, the roach started to feed. So the chub is the first to feed, and that makes him a great winter fish. Also from the chub, you can learn about fish and atmospheric pressure. You know the old rhyme, when the wind is in the west, then the fishes bite the best, when the wind is in the east, when the fishes bite the least, etc. Well, I don't believe it's wind. How can a fish know when the wind's in the east? I once went with a friend to fish two or three days on a roach swim on the River Star, and we caught good fish, quite easily, had great success. And then on the next day we went along and there was an easterly breeze and a high pressure system, as the weathermen call it. We took the same approach to the roach, fished hard, caught nothing. And then Sid Tuvi, my friend, wandered off and in a little while he came back to me with a big chub. We found that we could catch the big chub, lots of them, they were feeding. Now the roach is bottom feeder the chub feeds in mid-water. If the pressure builds up, the atmospheric pressure builds up on the surface of the water, it increases 
down to the bottom so that the roach at the bottom has the biggest load of pressure and it may be just too much for him. There may be just a, like with light, there may be just a point of discomfort that puts him off the feed. But the chub, higher up in the water, is in a degree or so less pressure and he would go on feeding. Now nearly all the east winds come with a high barometer and I think that's the real meaning of the rhyme. People used to be more interested in fly fishing for chub than they are now, it's a pity. It's the same thing, you have to have a big bait. Grasshoppers, beetles, great big bumbleflies. Chub flies are about twice as big as most other dry flies. My own favourite is a great big brown thing called Hardy's Favourite. Cast it out to the edge of the bushes, that's where he waits for his food to come. If he won't take, plop it behind him, he'll probably turn right round and grab it. It's interesting that, because a chub, waiting for falling food, gets used to not minding a splash. As long as you keep out of sight and never thump the bank, you can splash your bait. I had a silly example of that once on the River Ival. I'd been fishing for a chub for about an hour with a float and a bait set on about a foot of cast and I couldn't get any kind of a move out of him. In the end, I was absolutely fed up with him and furious. I stood up and said, blast him and slashed the tackle at him. The float hit the water and so did the bait and he took it. <laughs>